evening, everyone, and happy National Pathology Week, and welcome to the fifth RC Path Book Club. Um, my name's Nigel Brown. I work as a consultant clinical scientist in analytical toxicology. To explain, the main part of my job is interpreting drug analysis results produced in the laboratory for clinical and non-clinical staff. And like a number of other fellows of the Royal College of Pathologists, I've got a scientific, not a clinical background. A fab fact for you all, I do enjoy cycling and once cycled to a conference in the Netherlands after crossing the North Sea on a ferry. Anyway, there are a number of different roles within toxicology, which is one of the 17 pathology specialists. Um, some are involved in drug development and safety. Some, like myself, are involved in the analysis of clinical samples for drugs and the metabolites. Others, for example, analyse samples for a range of metals that includes lead and arsenic. Our roles range from being largely based in the laboratory to write, writing reports to advise other clinicians through to some patient facing roles. Tonight, we'll be discussing 10 drugs, how plants, powders and pills shape the history of medicine, written by Thomas Hager. Thomas is unfortunately no longer able to join us tonight due to personal reasons. In use for about 10,000 years, Thomas tells a captivating story of, the me of medicine. His subjects include the largely forgotten female pioneer who introduced smallpox inoculation to Britain, the infamous, infamous knockout drops, the first antibiotic which saved countless lives, the first antipsychotic which helped empty public mental hospitals, Viagra, statins, and the new frontier of monoclonal antibodies. I'm joined tonight by a fantastic panel, Professor Heather Wallace, Dr. Henry Oakley, Professor, Professor Michael Desuit, Lorraine Shalman Puy, and Dr. Preet Devi. And now I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves. Heather, do you want to start first? Yes, Thank of you. course. <laughs> of course. Hi there. Good evening. My name is Heather Wallace. I'm based at the University of Aberdeen. I'm an academic toxicologist um, and I teach undergraduate toxicology and postgraduate toxicology. My main interests are, are in carcinogenicity and I work for um, the MHRA and the European Food Safety Authority in a regulatory and risk assessment role as well. Thank you. Preet, would you like to go next? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Preet. I am an academic clinical fellow in haematology at Brighton and Sussex Hospital Trust. Um, I'm currently an IMT1, so I'm still quite early on in my career. 75% um, of my time is face-to-face um, -face with patients on the wards and in clinics and also doing on calls. And then 25% is research. I was quite lucky in that I got to do a foundation fellowship with um, the Royal College of Pathologists and in my spare time I like to do a lot of yoga and yes I did lose sensation in my knees at one point which was an issue but it's all good again. Thank you. Michael. Hello um, I'm Michael DeSweet and I'm a retired fellow of the um, of the Royal College of Physicians. Um, my clinical role was as a professor of obstetric medicine Obstetric medicine is looking after women who are pregnant as a physician, and these are women who have medical problems um, which may or may not interact with their pregnancies, such as heart disease and diabetes um, and so on. Uh, I'm also um, a garden fellow um, at, the, at the College of Physicians, uh, one of a group of six or eight of us that takes a particular interest in medicinal plants. That's me. Thank you. Henry, I'd like you to do your next, please. I'm Dr. Henry Oakley. I used to be a psychiatrist. I say consultant physician in psychological medicine because it sounds nicer. Um, and uh, I've always been interested in plants. And I took up medicine in order to pursue my hobby of interest in plants. Uh, and with plants, and particularly with orchids, uh, I moved my way up and I'm now vice president of the Royal Horticultural Society. And it was because of my plant interest that I got involved in the medicinal garden at the Royal College of Physicians, where we have 1,100 plants from the history of medicine, of which 50 or so, 50 or 60, are actually used to make medicines. And the rest were used by our predecessors and by herbalists to this day, and the number are named after uh, doctors. And uh, that's me. Thank you. And finally, Lorianne, thank you. 
Hi everyone, I'm Laurianne and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Sheffield Landscape Architecture Department and the Royal Horticultural Society. And I'm doing um, social science research on how gardens and gardening can impact our human well-being. So it's generally looking at the wider determinants of health, um, actually before we get to drugs and, and the generally well population. Um, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Lovely. Thank you, everybody. So just to quickly run through how the evening is going to work, we're going to start with a short reading from the book and that will then be followed by a panel discussion. Uh, please feel free to add your questions for the panelists to the Q&A area, the Zoom webinar. And then a selection of these will be put to the panel following the panel discussion. And then finally, just a little bit of housekeeping. The event's being recorded and it will be made available on the RCPATH YouTube channel. And whilst I don't use Twitter myself, so this is beyond me, if you'd like to tweet about this event, please tag us at, uh, at RCPATH and use the hashtags RCPATH Book Club and Pathology Week. So I shall read an ex excerpt from the book. So this is on behalf of uh, Thomas Hager, who's not able to make it this evening. Here is what drugs have done for us. In the bad old days, say 200 years ago, men lived twice as long, on average, as women, mostly because of the dangers of childbearing and birth. And everybody in general lived about half as long as they do today. A lot of that was tied to death in early life. If babies made it through the risks and traumas of childbirth, survived the epidemic diseases of childhood, smallpox, measles, whooping cough, diphtheria, and the more, and made it to adulthood, they could be considered lucky. Because then they could die of consumption, quinsy, cholera, gangrene, dropsy, syphilis, scarlet fever, or any of a few other dozen diseases we don't hear much about anymore. Today, we die from heart disease and cancer, diseases of the middle-aged, the elderly. People in the old days didn't worry too much about heart disease or cancer because few people in the old days lived long enough to get them. Thanks to drugs, a group of scientists recently wrote, people have different diseases, Doctors hold different ideas about those diseases, and diseases carry different meanings in society. I shall see in this book, vaccines and antibiotics moved us from being helpless victims of epidemics to being able to fight them off. Combined with more effective public health measures, cleaner drinking water, better sewage systems, better hospitals, drugs moved us from fearing the diseases of childhood to suffering the diseases of the old. That's a tribute to medicine in general and to drugs in particular. These are technological tools capable of changing our culture. But when you think about them, drugs are even stranger than that. Today's pharmaceuticals are high tech, developed in cutting edge laboratories after investments of tens of millions of dollars. But a kind of high tech so intimate, so personal, that they have to become part of you to do their work. You have to snort them, drink them, ingest them, inject them, rub them onto your skin, make them part of your body. They dissolve inside you and race through your blood from muscle to heart, liver to brain. Only then, when they are absorbed, when they have melted into you and melded with you, does the power unfold. They can attach and trigger, soothe and calm, destroy and protect, alter your consciousness, restore your health. They can jack you up or chill you out. They can addict you and they can save your life. What gives them this power? Are they animal, vegetable, or mineral? All of the above. Are they good for you? Often. Are they dangerous? Always. Can they perform miracles? They can. Can they enslave us? Some do. So, ever more powerful drugs, ever more powerful physicians, ever more diseases conquered. Seen this way, the story of drugs look like a triumphant march of progress, but don't be fooled. Much of the history of drugs, as you'll see, is rooted in error, accidents, and lucky breaks. Writing this book has, um, this is the author speaking, however, also convinced me that good old fashioned progress plays a central role too, if you define progress as a logical, rational application of a growing number of tested facts. Each new drug tells us new things about the body, and each new understanding of the body allows us to make better drugs. When the system is working well, each new scientific finding is criticized, 
tested and retested, amended if necessary, and then becomes part of the global library of facts available to other scientists. It builds. This synergy between drug making and basic science, this dance between lab and pill and body, described in tens of thousands of scientific publications over the past three centuries, is now speeding up in tempo and growing in intensity. It is truly progressive. If we can hold our world together, we are on the brink of greater things. The author then tells you what this book is not. It's not a scholarly history of the pharmaceutical industry. It contains no footnotes. It ignores, out of necessity for brevity, many world-shaking drug developments. You won't find every important drug here, but you'll find many of the drugs that have shaped both medical history and today's world. I hope you'll come away with a better understanding of this fascinating part of society. It's not a book that will teach drug scientists everything, anything very new, because it's not written for drug scientists. Rather, this book is for people who know just a little about drugs and want to learn more. It's aimed at the general reader, not the specialist, although I hope specialist true might come away with some interesting new stories to tell. Okay, so that's the, the excerpt from the book. I just thought I'd, I'd do a quick summary of what I've, I've picked up from the book and then open it up to the panel. I'd actually found this book a very good read. Um, I found myself enjoying it and reading it in a couple of sittings rather than a chapter of time as I would with a more technical book. What struck me first of all actually was tying it in with the family history search I've been doing on and off for a couple of years. Just to summarise, a cousin of my great grandmother married fairly late and this would be in her mid thirties. In the census the year after the wedding, both her and her husband's mother were in the house. Then the next bold fact was her death, presumably in childbirth. This was by the way in a fairly well off family living in the well to do suburbs of Liverpool. We are fortunate to live in the age we do. So I'll open it up to the panel. I love this book. I too read it in two sessions. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the adage which appeared in the papers recently that if you aren't interested in a book in the first 20 pages, throw it away. And I read it from cover to cover. Uh, I much enjoyed it. Um, and I learned a lot from it. It's easy to pick holes in things and just one or two things I would have liked to, to know uh, or mentioned. Um, Opium I was very happy with, except anyone who's ever tried uh, opium sap straight from the opium poppy seed head will know that it does contain opiates. You don't have to wait for it to dry. Perhaps you want to censor that bit. Um, <laughs> Lady M Mary's monster, I thought again was delightful, but uh, there are always things which you can put in. And the fact that uh, it was first called Globus Vitulinus, this practice of variolation, uh, and it was done in 1671 by a man called Heydrich Voldnard in Germany, I thought was worth a mention as he was promoting uh, Mary as being the founder of it, she wasn't. Mickey Finn is terrific. Chloral hydrate, the first totally artificial medicine, uh, was fantastic. I once gave it to a patient uh, who was screaming and screaming and screaming, and she passed out completely. And everybody in the ward thought she was dead. Fortunately, she wasn't. Um, how to soothe your cough with heroin, I thought was nice. Magic bullets, most impressive with the work that Domac did uh, in just sitting there day after week, after month, after year to get his um, Azo dies. And then when he went on holiday, somebody sorted it out for him. I thought that was lovely. As a psychiatrist, I enjoyed the least explored territory on the planet, but I would have liked to see uh, in the bibliography, I would have liked to see Delay and Denica, who really was so important in getting chlorpromazine onto the market, uh, properly referenced. Um, sex drugs and um, more drugs. Um, a fascinating story and uh, uh, much enjoyed reading it. The Enchanted Ring, ditto, enjoyed that. Statins, it was a personal story and I think perhaps he drifted too much into the personal story, but I did like his statistics that if one in a hundred uh, gets a heart attack and two, so it doesn't get a, sorry, if two in a hundred get heart attacks and if you're on statins, one in a hundred, that's 50%, uh, uh, it's not, it's 1%. Right. I thought that was a wonderful pointing out of statistics and I loved it. And the future of drugs, this book's out of date. It was written three years ago. It's well out of date. And uh, 
uh, when, when I think the, the borderline between the small molecules and the large antibody molecules is now being explored with the link between the, those molecules which are in between, which can get into the, into the cell, which the antibodies can't, but the small ones can. And you want something which gets in and alters the proteins. And that's where we're going. I thought it was terrific. Thank you. Lovely, thank you. Heather, would you like to say something quickly? Sure, yes. Um, so I suppose I was a bit surprised when I when I finally read the book. Um, I was expecting really drugs and the, the book is much broader than that. It's it's more of a, a history and a story. Um, and, and while Mike, uh, Henry says it's out of date, I think I think it's quite nice to to read that background um, in terms of what's what's coming forward. We'll talk about that later. But it, it was a, a nice set of stories. And, and certainly I found one or two things that I, I really didn't know um, about the development of some of these meds. Um, I think what the author Thomas has done is actually just pulled together an entertaining book that is worth reading, even if you're only just vaguely interested in, in medicine or toxicology or pharmacology. I think there's a, there's a good read here. And, and very like Henry and Nigel, I actually read this in, in two days, just uh, enjoyed it so much I couldn't put it down and I, I was really fascinated by the stories so I would just say thank you Thomas it's it's a good read. Hmm. Thank you. Preet would you give us a quick summary? Um, I kind of really agree with Heather. Um, I loved the fact that they had like little moments of anecdotes um, and not just being um, quite general about history, but little personal stories um, about families or um, a daughter and a father. And uh, when a daughter kind of eloped, I, I just I found these kind of examples really um, kind of grounding because I suppose just personally as someone who's prescribing medications on a ward round day to day um, it's it's quite interesting to understand holistically where these medications came from how they influenced people then and also how it you know people are influenced by the same medications now I really have an understanding for uh, opiate use now in particular I think and in pain management and the social reasons as to why it's driven their use as well so I think it's really kind of given me a bit of a broader understanding of how we use medications and how our uh, personalities and our emotions really dictate their use as well. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, Michael. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, of course, I enjoyed reading it. Is, it. It's a good book and a good read, as everybody has said. I think it's worth commenting that it is actually um, written by an American and written by somebody who is not a, a, not a doctor. He is a he is a um, a scientific journalist and and some of his language I found a bit strange um, for example his use of the term molecular biology um, and I quote where, where where he introduced the term amongst this last group were officials of the Rockefeller Foundation in the United States which in the 1930s began to lavish part of its enormous financial resources on the new field of molecular biology uh, one reason this effort appealed to business people and scientists was that it promised a better understanding of the relationship between biology and behavior. Well, that is not really molecular biology um, in, I think, the current, and dare I say it, British sense of the term, um, which um, really um, is, is, is a study um, of the mechanism by which genes express their function, uh, not his very, very broad um, given um, picture. Um, I like the drugs um, that he used and uh, for his, his, um, his description, um, I would include um, or even perhaps have substituted um, more. Um, for example, Digitalis. I mean, Digitalis, uh, which was um, made um, from foxgloves, um, and, and, and the use of it was um, studied and promoted um, by a physician in Birmingham um, called Withering. 
absolutely fundal, fundamental for the treatment of heart disease for generations um, and, and uh, ha had no mention. Not only was it fundamental for the treatment of heart disease, uh, but also um, the, the, the methodology uh, that Withering used to try and discuss, dis discover the correct dose, to discover the toxic effects, um, and indeed to discover which, in, in, in a huge mixture of potions that he was introduced, was the, um, the, the definitive factor. This many people have thought about as the beginning of the scientific basis of medicine. And for that reason, I think it should have been included. Thank you. And finally, last but not least, Lorianne. Um, yeah, so I really enjoyed it as well um, for some of the same reasons. And thank you, uh, Michael and Henry, for pointing out, you know, those little bits and pieces that, um, that you know, are worth clarifying. Um, despite those, I think that actually it was a really good example of science communication and, and bringing out the, all the, the personal stories behind the, the science that happens and that's what makes it maybe relevant to someone without the medical background um, or kind of you know not historians of science and it's the constant reminder that ultimately scientific activities are social activities and that everything comes out of the the current thinking the current patterns the current values of society um, at the time that the drugs are kind of being developed. And I mean, if anything, I suppose, maybe to sum up the comments, what I was thinking when I was hearing um, the other panelists speak, I was realizing that maybe the main issue we have is actually with the title, um, that, you know, it's maybe not so much, well, yeah, there are 10, um, but maybe they're not all, all drugs and there is really only the one chapter on the plant. Um, and then, yeah, maybe the others are powders and pills, but they are all, um, different aspects that have shaped yeah the history of medicine and really interesting comparisons I thought between um, the opiate crisis in the 1820s uh, 1830s versus current day um, would be interesting I suppose to link the vaccination things to what's happening currently um, but yeah lo lots of interesting things where stories really come together I think. Lovely thank you. Um Right, there's a couple of little specific questions um, I was going to like to ask. So first of all, um, the drugs featured in the chapters of this book aren't necessarily the most important ones. Uh, Thomas states that he's picked each drug for its historical importance plus its entertainment value. Of the drugs and milestones featured in the book, which ones do we think are the most important or shaped medical history the most? Um, Heather, could I ask you first, please? Yes, sure. Um, so, I suppose um, if I was thinking about um, people's lives, one would one would say the pill really has shaped um, women's lives. But I think for me, um, the the chapter on antibiotics really um, and antibiotics would be what I would choose would be the medicines that changed medical history because um, I mean without antibiotics we would we wouldn't be much further forward than we were at the beginning of the twentieth century. Um, you know the the, the fact that um, all of these things stemmed from sulfur and what it did um, and you know people like Alexander Fleming it's 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 a, a fantastic story and it, it's told in a in a very engaging manner but to me it's it's the antibiotic story is very exciting because we're now at a stage where um, really in the last probably 30 years or so we haven't had many new antibiotics or, or should I say new classes of antibiotics and, and we, we are in a bit of a, an antibiotic crisis. Um, antimicrobial drug resistance is an issue and something that we have to face. So it's, it's, it's a We've, we've brought it on ourselves, <laughs> if you see what I mean, because of, of indiscriminate prescribing. But, you know, in, in the hundred years since they were discovered, um, they've done wonders for medicine and shaped medicine enormously. Thank Could you. I come Thank in uh, there, Nigel? Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to come in because I felt exactly the same as you, Heather, that um, antibiotics were perhaps the most important of the drugs that he mentions. And the reason I would say that is apart from all the very good reasons that Heather has described, antibiotics are the only ones of these drugs that actually cure something. Yes. You know, you, you take the antibiotics 
they kill the bugs and you get better and you don't need to go on taking them. But if you start on statins, you're going to take them for the rest of your life. Uh, and the same would apply to many of the other uh, agents that he's described. Mm. Yep, lovely, thank you. Pleet, would you have anything to add to the... So which... the one that I was particularly interested in was Lady Mary's Monster, which was focusing on smallpox and vaccination. Now, I know a lot of people would kind of argue that maybe vaccination isn't a medication, um, but the, the why I view it as a milestone, I guess, is in my view I suppose the best way of kind of overcoming any kind of disease is primary prevention and vaccination is very much something that is a hot topic at the moment what with COVID um, and I think it's just really interesting to see the story behind what had happened there and uh, I think interestingly um, the whole idea of kind of going to Turkey, seeing the practice there of kind of with small uh, smallpox and kind of scraping bits into um, children's arms. I found that really interesting that, you know, well, in a way, that's a form of uh, disseminating research, which is something that we're kind of all encouraged to do. So sharing that wealth of knowledge and seeing that happen in, you know, um, as early on as this kind of 1700s was really interesting. Um, so I, I found that really uh, quite amazing to see something happen so early on and maybe I'm naive in that you know thinking okay this is something we just know and do now but seeing it so early then and how it was brought about and shared and um, kind of bringing out these kind of trials on the prisoners I found it really interesting to see how we try to validate and share the information and create that validity that we can do this and how it shapes what we still do today. Lovely, thank you. Um, another question which popped up is, are there any, apart from digitalis, which we've already discussed, are there any other interesting drugs, particularly plant-derived ones, that, you, that we think should have featured in the book? Um, Lillian, do you want to have any, any that you can think of? And then I'll do we'll this. Yeah, I won't go on for too long because I know Henry wrote the book on this, um, several books. Um, but one thing that did come up for me, of course, there's there's Digitalis. Um, I watched the James, the new James Bond movie yesterday, and there's a scene where like it's kind of mentioned as stopping your heart, but I think they really missed the opportunity to go on about it a bit more. But um, the other one that I was thinking of was Snowdrops, so Galanthus and um, the Galantamine that's that was derived from there um, has been used to treat Alzheimer's disease. Um, and that also, I think could have made a worthy chapter because I don't know the whole history, maybe Henry can complete it, but I know that it has been um, talked about um, since ancient um, ancient Greek. So it's been in the stories of Circe and Odysseus that Homer wrote about. Um, so I'm, I'm sure there would have been plenty more to write in there, but I'll pass over to Henry quickly. <laughs> yes, Henry. <laughs> Thank you. I think the story about galantamine and acetylcholinesterase as being the antidote to Circe's poison is a nice story and I like it. Um, but I think it's a bit like statins, uh, if I may say so, that uh, if in Alzheimer's you have reduced acetylcholine levels in the brain, taking anticholinesterase inhibitors to raise the acetylcholine in your brain doesn't actually do very much for Alzheimer's, regrettably. But the drugs I would like to have seen in were the anti-cancer drugs. Um, but uh, I think you asked which is the most important uh, drug which was mentioned and for me, and I think it was chlorpromazine because when chlorpromazine came in uh, in the 19, end of the well, 1950s, um, it's very slow to take effect. And when I became a consultant psychiatrist in 1973, um, there, I had 2,400 patients in beds in my catchment area. And I took over 2,400 beds with 56 beds because the NHS had reckoned that chlorpromazine would cut the number of patients required to be in hospital beds, which of course it did, partly by closing the beds and putting them out in the community. But chlorpromazine and the neuroleptics really did revolutionize uh, the lives of thousands and thousands of people. As he, he, um, he points out in the book, uh, not without its side effects, but I think almost all medicines are 
with side effects. Lovely, thank you. Michael, do you want to add anything more? Oh yes, <clears throat> I'd really, really like to mention quinine, um, which is a pretty strongly plant-derived medicine from the bark of the cinchona tree, which completely changed um, the way the world was. Uh, perhaps people aren't aware that uh, malaria was endemic in North America, was endemic in the um, Fens um, in East Anglia, um, and it was um, quinine which, to a sense, uh, made um, these areas um, inhabitable. Even more so, of course, in tropical regions where um, the malaria parasites are still um, present. And without quinine, the economic development of those countries uh, would have been impossible. Hmm. Lovely. Thank you, everyone. OK. Um, Hi, Joe. Right. Can I, can I, yeah. can I yeah, just do. come in for a, a moment there? I'd just like to um, take up Henry's point about the anti-cancer drugs, because there, there are a really large number of anti-cancer drugs that we use now, um, things like etoposide, the taxanes, the vinca alkaloids, all of these are all plant-derived products and, the, and they have been, you know, um, universally good in helping in the treatment of, of cancers um, across the world. So I think, I think that is an important point, an important group or class of medicines that he missed out in, in this book. Yes, mm. I think pedophilin was fascinating because uh, um, etoposide from Pedophilum peltatum uh, is a North American plant which was used by the North Americans for treating warts. When it came to Europe, it was used for treating uh, sexually transmitted warts. And then it was converted from being a pure sap, which actually was present in the plant, extremely poisonous sap, uh, into etoposide and tenoposide, the first treatments for lung cancer and sarcomas and things like that. And Catharanthus roseus, the Madagascar periwinkle, which was uh, fantastic. It's in indigenous to Madagascar, but escaped from all over the world. So it's a weed in Hong Kong and in Jamaica. And in Jamaica, they were using it for treating type 2 diabetes because it's pretty toxic and drops your blood sugar. And they found it uh, affected the white cells of, of uh, the marrow of, 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 of rabbits. And uh, they changed the death rate from leukemia in children from 100% to 30%, and it's still in use today. And uh, Taxus Bacata, the yew tree, wonderful story there. I mean, the great thing about this book is the stories behind it, the history of all these plants. It's, I, I complain it's a bit superficial, and I complain that I don't have enough source references, and a lot of it is slightly anecdotal, but it's a wonderful book. But Taxus Bacatus and the story of how they found that the anti-cancer drug in it was present in the leaves of the European yew and was present there because of a fungus which lives in the leaves and produces a taxol, pacotaxol, the anti-cancer drug, to deter other fungi from attacking the yew tree. And we're using the chemicals which the plant produced to protect itself, to kill off invaders, and we use it as a cytotoxic for killing off cancer cells. And it's stories like that. And sorry, lastly, I, I go on a bit, I'm sorry, but colchicine from uh, Autumn Crocus. What a fantastic drug. Uh, it treats gout. <laughs> it, it treats gout. It can treat, treats Bechet syndrome. It treats viral pericarditis. Uh, it treats, um, oh, I've forgotten what else it treats, but... Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, lots of thing, different things that it does treat, uh, all of which it does by its attacking the, ge the genetics and the division and the production of uh, white cells. Fantastic drugs. So anti-cancer drugs and culture seed, I would like to have seen. Maybe he'll do another book. Well, hopefully, yes. Right. Well, we're, we're getting on very well. OK. Um, right. And I've... And I've fascinated here about the, the yew trees as well. So throughout the 10 drugs, Thomas presents us with lots of interesting and unusual facts. Uh, what surprised you the most when you were reading 10 drugs? Did you learn any new facts? Um, Heather? Yeah, well, um, for me, the, the most interesting fact was that, you know, vaccination wasn't introduced by Edward Jenner, which I had been taught <laughs> for a very long time, and that actually Lady Mary 
Pierre Point was the person who um, really started it all off. And, and for me, the, her story is, is fascinating because, you know, of her time, she must have been a very, very doubtable lady. She, she must have been, you know, fantastically strong willed and strong minded and, and you know, to 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 succeed and, and to actually run the first clinical trials, as, as we would call them nowadays, um, you know, all, albeit using um, prisoners and, and things and orphans, which is not very, not very helpful. But, you know, I mean, it, it really was a fascinating story that um, I, I was completely unaware of. I was, I was sure it was cowpox and Edward Jenner and the milkmaids. And um, there you go. <laughs> Great. Just to second that, I 100% agree. I, I find it amazing um, to be a researcher anyway, or like, you know, just the fundamental qualities, the resilience is so key, just not knowing what's going to happen or, you know, trying to um, kind of keep at it to understand and really make sense of what's going on. I mean, I suppose she kind of went to Turkey and then came back but still that resilience as a woman of that time is just insane and to keep going and to keep you know fighting the the cultural aspect of the time to really disseminate that information I found it incredible so I just wanted to second that I just found it incredible but there were loads of facts um that I didn't know about and I, I you know 70% of adult males in China were addicted or habituated to opium as well I found that quite overwhelming you know going from um China speaking about uh, or you know in the book it kind of detailed how they you know were aware of the dangers and the fears surrounding opium um to kind of the historical influences which led to that statistic uh, it's crazy to think of how influential that drug was um, and its different formulations over hundreds of years um, and the unfortunateness of the addiction. Uh, I found that quite overwhelming. Mm, lovely, thank you. Michael. Um, Heather and I always seem to say, think the same way. So I won't <laughs> witter on about vaccination, but I wanted to echo what Henry was saying about Domacic, this guy who worked for four years um, on the sulfonamides and in particular Prontazil. You know, because, because in the 1930s, childbed fever was the major cause of maternal mortality by a long way. And Prontazil was the first drug that could cure people from childbed fever. And this was of particular relevance to me working at Queen Charlotte's Hospital because it was there that Colebrook, the director of pathology at the time, first used Prontosil for the first time in this country. So that was pretty exciting for me. Hmm. Henry, anything more to add? I think what impressed me was in looking at the history, how long it took for a new treatment to be accepted and passed on. And also uh, how people get forgotten. And Lady Mary may have been forgotten, but Heinrich Wolfnacht, who invented variolation uh, 50 years before Mary, uh, is another forgotten character. And uh, I also liked his concept of the siege. I thought that was a very nice idea. You know, take your treatment while it still works mm. before they find it kills you. <laughs> yes. Lauriane. Um, yeah, I mean, there were so many facts. There was um, probably more things that I learned than things that I knew already, definitely. Um, but one thing, just to go to to go back to the vaccination chapter on Lady Mary, one thing that frustrated me a little, I suppose, is that there was hardly anything on how those Turkish women knew how to do the, the 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 grafting process that they were doing, and and I I just felt that there wasn't enough not necessarily credit, but the, the background story of where that was coming from. Um, uh, but otherwise, one thing that's th the most interesting fact, I suppose, for me, which is maybe quite niche, um, because I have done a lot of research on domestic gardens, was um, the the uh, war effort that all just normal civilians were taking part in by growing poppies in their domestic gardens, their 
front and back gardens and I just find it quite funny because in, so this was during the American Civil War and of course today in especially suburban America there are so many regulations and what you can and can't do in your garden like how tall your grass must be um, and and that was something that everyone could get involved with to, to grow um, the opium for both the north and the south um, soldiers that were fighting and I mean, of course, we have echoes of that in, in the UK in terms of dig for victory and things like that, but also um, definitely in Sheffield, maybe in other, I think in London as well. I don't know if you've ever noticed the iron um, railings and fences of front gardens. You might see that they've been all cut down. That was also part of a war effort um, that people were cutting down their railings to be able to give them to be melted down, to be used for, for metal and war effort. So the really interesting kind of participation of, of everyone in that, but yeah. Lovely, thank you. Um, right, another question. We're doing very well for time, I think. Um, in chapter four, um, he makes reference to the United States Harrison Act of 1914. And of course, um, control of drugs is, is different in this country. And he compares the United States to Britain, where we decided that drug addicts were medical patients. So have anybody, any of you picked up what lessons we could learn from this book about drug addiction and how it could be handled in the past and maybe how it could be handled in the future? I think if I make a quick comment here, because that's a large chunk of my work, my view is it's, it's more of a, a disease than a crime, although high level dealers um, are, in my mind, criminals, because at part of my job, I occasionally get to see the details of some of the addicts and what their life was like. And to be honest, if that was me, I would be tempted to turn to a drug that would help me just blot the whole thing out. So the views of those in power change quite quickly and they can suddenly be, bring in major upheavals in the various systems, helping those who are most vulnerable, leaving them and their carers at a loss of what the new system is demanding of them. So um, I thought I'd start with Henry. Have you got any views on whether addiction is a disease or a, or a crime? Or a moral defect. Yes. Yes, indeed. I don't think it's either, any of them. It's not a disease, it's an addiction. It's not a moral defect, it's an addiction. It's not a crime, it's an addiction. It's only a crime if you say taking heroin is a crime. And so I think that's, an, that's, that's a silly way. Um, I'm happy with your concept of dealing. Well, Henry, you, you, you've muted yourself. No. Oh, every time I unmute. So. Hmm. Well, I'm back. Yep. I'm back. Like my microphone keeps turning green. Is there a reason for that? Um, no. I'm a firm believer that uh, people who are add addicted should be helped to get off their addiction, and so they need treatment. Uh, they don't, and treat, I think 10 treatments is what this book should have been called. They need treatment, they need assistance, they need the medicines to be found to help them come off their uh, addiction, and they need the psychological support and the social support, the physical support, the financial support, and all those things to come off their addiction so they get back into better health. And you can only call addiction a disease if you say disease is the absence of health. Yeah, thank you. Um, anybody else like to make a comment on that one? Yes, yes. I mean, we don't say that cigarette smoking um, is a uh, crime, yet that is just as much an addiction um, as is opiate addiction. Um, so I think we ought, perhaps the Americans, ought to reassess their attitudes. Um, and, and our politicians ought to uh, assess the attitudes, because so long as dealing in drugs um, is, is, is criminal, um, then people will continue to do it. And really um, access to drugs um, should, be, um, should be licensed and taxed um, in the same way uh, as um, access to alcohol and for that matter, tobacco. Hmm. Although I have wondered what the drug dealers would do if we remove their sources of income exactly. from them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we think the same way, Nigel. Yep, yep. Um, Heather, have you got anything you'd like to add to that one? 
No, for me, I, I actually agree very much with Henry. I, I think that it's 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 neither criminal nor a you know nor a, it's an addiction, and it has to be treated with the proper resources. And you know, at the moment, the resources are overstretched and um, insufficient. So we need we need to change that in some way. But that is political rather than um, anything else. Yeah. yeah. Um, Preach. Anything to add? No, I just agree with everyone else yeah. on this one, for sure. Um, Lorian, anything to add? Not really, but just, I suppose, in Heather's comment that it's more political and it's also, it's also social, it depends on where these where people are living, what, what are, as someone said, social support as well. Um, it's about so much more than just um, any criminal convictions or or um or medical history or whatever um it's it's just the whole context in which we live in basically yeah lovely thank you so um what are, what are the questions have we got right very quickly um who were the standout people standout characters in the in the in the book um we have, we've sort of mentioned them as we've been going along, but very quickly, just a couple of names. Heather, would you like to start, please? Right. So as a, as a card carrying toxicologist, I'm going to have to say Paracelsus. <laughs> um, I mean, he didn't he didn't get very much of a mention, really. But I mean, Paracelsus was the founder of modern day pharmacology and toxicology. He was the man who realized that everything that you take has the potential to give you a remedy or a poison. And the difference is the dose. So it's the dose that makes the remedy and the dose that makes the poison. So Paracelsus is a standard out for me. Great. So that was actually mine also but as I'd already <laughs> said previously I feel like I'm on the same wavelength as Heather today um, but also Lady Montague just as I mentioned previously the whole idea of kind of dissemination of research and also resilience as um, a woman of her time not only culturally but also just trying to push the information forward to better those around her. Thank you. Michael. Yes well my hero is Marker the um, chemist who realized he could take his donkey into Mexico and bring back um, yams uh, and make shed loads of progesterone uh, which nobody had been able to synthesize before. And of course, the significance of that um, was the contraceptive pill, which has changed the lives of women um, throughout the world. And the poor guy didn't actually patent the process. Hi. Henry. I was going to say exactly the same words, but not so fluently as Michael has just done. So Mr. Marker is my hero. Along Thank with uh, Mr. Domak, Prontosil. Oh, Leanne. Um, I wouldn't say he's my hero, but um, one of the characters I think I got most invested in um, was Henri Laborie from the Chlor... I can't mm. say it. Chlorpromaz Chlor Chlorpromazine um, mm. chapter. Um, to, to hear about, first of all, his, his experiences during the war and ultimately, I think, a character that was very interdisciplinary and probably a context that that didn't really accept that interdisciplinarity but he was so amenable to to, to bringing um the 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 i can't remember the acronym of the drug before it became called chlorpromazine now rp something or other a number um some letters and numbers and and how he brought that then into into um psychiatry and i thought it was also um a slightly sad story in a sense that his work got completely superseded and, and, and went way beyond him, which I mean, of course it does in all scientific um, advances and progress and things like that. But it, it I thought it, the, well, the author, Thomas, I thought really used um, Henri's story as, as a vehicle to, to talk about that. And I, I got really invested in, in, in his story um, and I, ended up googling a bit more about him afterwards and yeah brilliant thank you okay um in the epilogue um thomas speculates about the future of drugs very briefly what are your thoughts on this 
what do you think the key possibilities and challenges are that will come across in the near future? And Heather, could I start with you, please? Yep, of course. So um, for me, um, what's, what's happening just now is that, um, you know, the, the targets that we have left, if you like, to attack that are linked to disease are actually much more complicated and much more difficult than they have been for the past 60, 70 years. And so these, these targets being more difficult, they're more costly to attack. So what, what I feel is which is happening is that um, we're making medicines for smaller and smaller groups of patients. So we're, we're, we're actually specializing our medicines. We're, we're making personalized or stratified or individualized medicines now, and we're going to be testing these medicines on smaller groups. Now that has consequences for cost, which means that these medicines are going to be very expensive, but, but that's the way the industry is heading. In terms of what I think we need to think about is I think we need to think about chemo prevention. Um, you know, we, we know about vaccines as a preventative, but I think chemo prevention is going to be the way forward. And it may well be that natural products, things from plants um, and animals are, are going to be the chemo preventatives of the future. But for me, chemo prevention is something that needs to be invested in going forward. Lovely, thank you. Well, we've got about two minutes, I think, ready for the final, very quickly, folks, if you could say in turn, um, what do you, what will you, and what could readers take away from this book? Um, if I, Laurie Ann, would you like to start? Just very quickly, I think we've got about two minutes. I mean, I, I think I've probably said it at the beginning, just about how social science is. Yep, Henry? just that the history of how medicines are developed and how they are uh, marketed uh, and that a good journalist writes very well and can communicate medicine and uh, important aspects of it. That's what I took away from the book. Thank you. Michael. Yes, I, I, I would say the same thing in a slightly different way. Um, the study of, of, of medicine and the development of drugs is such fun in good hands. Thank you. Preet. Medicines are neither good nor bad, they're both. Heather. So I would say what I took from this is that perseverance wins the race at the end of the day. Mm. You have to persevere, if, whether you're Lady Mary or whether you're the guy with Brontosil, you have to persevere. And um, you know it, it is a cyclic process. Every so often it works and then it goes away. So <laughs> perseverance. Thank you. Um, I think we've got, there's one question come from the, through from the audience. So very quickly, how, how much do you think we have left to learn from plants and microbes with respect to drug development? Or will most new devices be the result of artificial, that's human design, you know, like using computers and so on in future? Um, Henry, would you like to very briefly give your thoughts on that one? I think very few new medicines will come from plants. No plant de developed medicines for its evolutionary benefit. It just produced poisons, a la Paracelsus. Um, I think, sorry, I, I think the future will be in things like lentiviruses transmitting genomes for things like cystic fibrosis into uh, people with monogenic genetic disease. Lovely. Thank you. Um, right. Well, I think we are running short of time. So, right. Um, so to, to finish off with, oh, right, just uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. Again, what is the legal aspect of gene therapy? I think this is probably going to be opening a huge uh, can of worms, but Michael, have you got any views on that one? Um, was the question the, the legal aspects of gene therapy? The, yeah. Yeah, and which is with all respect, completely out of the remit of this book. Yeah. I mean, it's a, a huge um, challenge that you might be able to uh, treat diseases before people even get them by manipulating their genomes, but it's got nothing to do with drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I agree. So, but it, it's something Everybody that wants to say something. But there are already, there are already gene therapy going on and it's perfectly legal. We've 
can treat hemophilia in the process of treating cystic fibrosis. We're in the process of treating um, muscular dystrophy by gene therapy. Quite different from altering genes, fetal, fetal genes to make them boys or girls or one thing or another. Yeah, well, I think um, because we're, we're almost at seven o'clock and we do, when we're due to finish. So I think that's all the questions we've got time for. But before we close the event, I'd like to highlight some of the other activities and events you can take part in this week for National Pathology Week. Uh, this year's theme is All Together Now. Um, there's a special webinar event for RCPATH members on Wednesday with the founder of Harvey's Gang, um, and which Harvey's Gang encourages ill children to become trainee biomedical scientists for the day and tour laboratories with family members. And we're also offering pathology teams the chance to win a restaurant voucher worth £100 in this year's National Pathology Week Twitter competition. All you need to do is to tweet a photo or short video that portrays our theme all together now and include the hashtag all together now. Remember to tag us too at RCPATH. Please tell, tell your students and others about National Pathology Week events. There's a veterinary pathology workshop with the Royal Veterinary College tomorrow. Uh, several Meet the Pathologists virtual pathology careers talks for 13 to 18 year olds and the pub quizzes for medical biomedical and veterinary students on Thursday and Friday and that features the guest appearance from the RCPATH president Prof Mike Osborne and you can find out more ideas about how to get involved um, and the details for all our events at the website which is on your screen now. So um, we hope you enjoyed tonight's book book club and we'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, the RCPATH public engagement team will be sending a short feedback form after the event. Please do take a few minutes to fill this in. And as an added incentive, you'll be entered into a draw to win a £20 national book token. We'll be adding more information about upcoming book club events to the RCPATH book club page, so please do keep an eye out. I think all that's now left for me to do is to say thank you to our wonderful panellists, Heather, Henry, Michael, Loriana and Preet. And of course, and everybody else who turned in, tuned in tonight and enjoy the rest of your National Pathology Week and stay safe, everyone. And good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Yep. Good Thanks, night.